Um, I record the classes and I put them up on YouTube. So if you miss class, you can watch it. Um, what else? Uh, if I need to cancel class for any reason, which will be highly unlikely, uh, you'll get a message by 4 o'clock. Should give you plenty of lead time. I don't think any of you are driving from you know Chattanooga or Knoxville or anything like that. I have had students actually before come from Huntsville. Um, I don't know why. Um, so, students with disabilities, you know who you are. You know what you need to do. I should have already received it. I think I actually have from most of you. Okay, what else? This syllabus, by the way, is on D2L. It's on the announcements page, and it's on the contents page in both a Word format, Docs format, and PDF. I might have tweaked a couple of little things today uh, without posting an update. Um, cell phones, laptops, all that kind of stuff. I hate going into this, but I have to uh, because... Because of, I've, I've been doing this, I'm starting my 27th year at MTSU, 30th year overall teaching, and the last couple of years have just been mind-blowing in terms of some of the things students have, have done. So, use of cell phones for calls, texting, selfies, don't. I had a student two years ago, I think it was a night class, another room in the university, like sitting in that back corner, and I'm not kidding. Literally, every class period for about the first three weeks, for about 20 minutes, and I'd say, I can't remember what her name was, Dakota, put it down. And I finally said, if you do it one more time, you're gone. F. She ended up with an F. Not for that. It was because, you know, she was so focused on herself, she couldn't see anything in front of her. And obviously, didn't belong to the university. So, but if you are a first responder, okay, EMT, fire police, etc., okay, let me know, and you can have your phone or pager out. Okay, um, I'll just put it on silent. Similarly, if you have an ongoing family situation or emergency, you have a loved one who is in the hospital, you have a loved one who has a terminal disease. All the examples I will give are all the examples I've had multiple times over the last 26 years. Um, that requires you to keep your phone available. Let me know, like tonight, or not next week, but the week after, or as soon as that situation arises. I don't, you know, I don't want to be a bringer of bad news, but one of you will have somebody in your family something's going to happen this semester it, it, you can almost make book on it. it in my classes for some reason that has happened literally every semester for the last 10 years okay so when that happens let me know you don't have to go into a lot of detail dr sherman we've had a family emergency i can't be here tonight or I can't be here the next three nights, or I don't think I could finish the semester. Let me know. Don't just drop. That is, don't just disappear. Because if you let me know, it's all on YouTube. I'll work with you to make sure you can finish the course. Okay? But if you don't let me know, you dug that hole. And I can't do anything if you come to me the last week of class or the day before the final is turned in. I had two students last semester. They like stopped coming in March. And then suddenly, the end of April, oh, I just forgot to tell you, I meant to send you an, e to send you an email, but I forgot, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. So, um, Strongly discourage use of laptops and tablets for note taking, not if you're using them for, you know, reading the text and stuff. And I used to have a, an asterisk here by the studies, and I had a list of, of links to these articles. Okay? A number of studies um, have proven that students use laptops, tablets in the classroom, perform worse, and learn less than students who read the rest, take notes by hand. Why? Because when you're taking notes by laptop, 
You know what you tend to do? You tend to try to get everything. You're taking notes by hand. You know you can't. You can't write as fast as I can talk, believe me. Okay? So your brain filters, and it filters out unneeded things, you know, articles, definite articles, conjunctions. It keeps the important stuff, nouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, pronouns. Okay? Um, but it doesn't mean you can't. You want to take notes by laptop and such, that's fine. Okay? Um, but if I see or someone reports to me, a computer, cell phone, tablet, laptop, etc., is being used for Facebook, email, internet searching, Pornhub, yeah, I've had all of those. I've had students come up and go, Dr. Sherman, can you talk to so and so? Because, you know, it's got porn flashing on the screen. I'm like, really? <laughs> you talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> that nonsense. I won't, in fact, if that happens, I won't even talk to you. I'll just send your name straight over to Judicial Affairs or whatever it's called, and they'll haul your ass up in front of me. And they'll take care of it. Um, but, if I do have to talk to you and you keep doing it, you know, I'll contact the feds and you'll get removed from the class. Okay? Classroom decorum. <clears throat> Attendance, participation, and decorum are expected. What's decorum? Good behavior. Proper manners, so to speak. I know, two things that seem totally out the window in our society. So, these mean, arrive to class on time, uh, and with this door, you know, if that door closes, it locks. So, uh, after class, if you arrive after class, it's begun, it's rude, disrespectful, and disruptive. And since it does stay locked, probably about 10 after 6, I'll stop opening it. And I'll tell others to stop opening it. So, um, what else? You're quiet, pay attention to me or others if others are speaking. You're courteous to each other. It doesn't mean you come in and bow to each other. Just, you know, be nice to each other. Sheesh. <laughs> when speaking in class, you should lose, use language appropriate to the setting. No swearing or foul language, and I'll be the first offender. I already was. Um, don't eat during, I don't really mind if you eat. Just don't come in with a four-course meal or a bag of crunchy Doritos because the people next to you are going to be doing this, okay? Um, don't sleep. Probably won't have a problem in this class. I've had several 8 o'clock classes where I've had to, who am I watching? I've had to go up to the table and do that because somebody's head was down on it. Usually quite a bit harder so that their head pops up and slaps back down. Yeah, I will do that, by the way. Um, what else? Do not do homework assignment. Okay. Uh, don't do homework or assignments for other classes during this class. Don't wear headphones, earbuds. Because of two students last year, I could hear the music up here. They're like back in the corner. Uh, I mean, I'm going a little hard of hearing, but with, if I can hear it over here, everybody can hear it. Okay? Don't cheat or plagiarize, obviously from another work. And come prepared to participate in class. After 26 years of teaching, I've added this sentence. This means that you bring the... Shut up, Siri. <laughs> this means that you bring the current book to class each night. So, Fellowship of the Ring. Not next week, Labor Day. The following week. Have it with you. If you come without a, I should be more specific. I shouldn't say without a book. If you come without the current book and or a means to take notes, you'll be penalized. Five points. Okay? Because I am not kidding. The same classroom, morning class, started off with about this number, ended up with about a third. But I had, of those, probably this class size at the beginning, half the people never brought a book. 
and never brought anything to take any notes on. Yeah, they just did this the whole time. Or, or, okay. <clears throat> In fact, I had one guy then come up at the end of class, it, towards the end of the semester, you know, and uh, I had had it with him. I had just had it. End of his class, beginning of the next class. So the students are coming in for my next class. And he's like, I don't understand why I got an F on this paper. And I proceeded to explain why. You know, he didn't have any quotations, for example, from the book or something like that. And he said something, and I, find, I just lit into him. I, just, I don't remember what his name was, Jamal or something like that. I said, Jamal, you come here every day. You sit right where you are. You come in here, you sit in here every day, you sprawl out, no, I'm not kidding, sprawled out, you play on your phone, you've never brought a book to class, you've never taken a single note in class. What does that tell me? Well, I'm here. That's, that's better than not, because there were, of those, you know, two-thirds who didn't finish, they didn't drop. I think I had one person drop. They just disappeared. It's like they went off into the ether. I, I literally, I never heard from them. Again, I never saw them again. Their name showed up on the final roll when I had to submit grades. Okay. So, come prepared. Okay. Most of you, many of you, not quite half of you have read Lord of the Rings. Most of you have read the Harry Potter novels. That at least should be something you'll get a little bit interested in, right? So if you don't buy these guy, abide by these guidelines, I'll speak to you. If you persist, it won't be fun. Um, you're allowed one absence. Why? Because we only meet once a week. And then we have next week. Okay, so we're down to, we only have 13 classes, I think it is. My Thursday night class only has 12. Why? Because they also lose Thanksgiving, but then they don't have a class the last week of class. So the last week that we meet before finals is the week before Thanksgiving. And then there's three weeks. Yeah, so I'm just giving them their final then. <laughs> they'll, they'll turn it in first of December. Um, so you're allowed one absence. A second absence will result in a one-letter grade reduction. The third... Yeah, terminated. I mean, uh, third is you're out of here, okay? Um, if you're not present when I kick roll or when you take a quiz, you get absent to zero for the quiz, etc. No makeup quizzes. What else? Papers are due at the beginning of class on the assigned days. There are assigned days on there. They're exams. They're not paper papers. They're exam. Take home exams, okay? Um, unapproved late papers will receive an F. If you talk to me beforehand, again, if you have that kind of family emergency come up, right, and talk to me, yeah, I might extend it, right? Uh, but if you just say, oh, I don't have it done, can I turn it in next week? I'll say, sure. You'll get an F. What does that mean? It means you get 55 points. If you don't turn it in, you fail the course. So turn it in, even if it's late. Turn it in. You get 55 points. That 55 points is, we're going to talk a lot about mercy and pity because Tolkien brings that up early on in The Lord of the Rings. That's my mercy and pity. I understand what your shoes are like. I've been there, okay? Things happen. 55 points will not bury you. Not turning it in. Grave is dug. It's piled on top, and then there's no coming, there's no resurrection. It's you're dead, dead. Okay, so <laughs> don't go there. Grading grading is real easy. Add up the total number of points you've earned, divided by the total number of points possible, and that gives me a number somewhere in here. Hopefully, on this side, not on this side. Okay. If it's an 89.4, it's a B plus. If it's an 89.6, it's an A. Right? Just goes up. Um, 
in that five oh let me just slide that. Um assignment reading schedule. Let's see, anything else there? No makeup quizzes will be given. Again, late exams papers will be accepted only extreme cases, only with my prior approval. Failure to submit any assignment other than a daily quiz is an F for the course. Okay. So this is what's just absolutely crazy. So we have felt introduction today, which is what we're doing. I sent an email out and said, try to read as much of the Fellowship of the Ring as you can. How many did? Only chapter one. Chapter one? You didn't receive the email? Uh, I didn't. Or it wasn't an email. It was, yeah, it was an email. And it was on, it was on the announcements. Okay. I read that today. Yeah. Honestly. And that's kind of what I expected. So um, I understand. So we probably won't talk much about the Fellowship of the Ring tonight. We'll probably spend some time going over... Um, The, the forward to the second edition, okay? What that means is next week we have Labor Day, no class. The following week, we will do all of Fellowship of the Ring, okay? That will not include the prologue. That will include all of that. Yeah. A little over 400 pages. Not much over. Actually, it's a little under 400 pages because of the prologues oh. included there. So it's about 390 or so pages. Okay? And then the following week, the two towers. Okay? And then the following, yeah. So you know you said a novel week, so is that literal? Yeah. In the, well, with the Lord of the Rings, in the sense that the Fellowship of the Ring is kind of a no, it's not literary. It is a section of the Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is one novel. Do not refer to it, as some people do, as a trilogy. It's not. A trilogy are three separate but interconnected by theme stories. These aren't three separate stories connected by a theme. It's just one story divided into three sections. Okay? Very, very different thing. Um, so... First third, essentially. Second third, essentially. Last third, essentially. Return of the Kings is the shortest of them. Two Towers, I think, is shorter than Fellowship. Not by much. Okay? Uh, most of the Return of the King is the appendix at the end. Tolkien just wants to tell us all kinds of history and chronology and how to pronounce words and names and all that kind of thing. Okay? So, 23rd... If all goes according to schedule, I will distribute the Tolkien exam, okay? which will be, um, you'll write, I think I have in here, something like 750 to 1,000 words, which is roughly three to four pages, two and a half, three pages, a little over three pages. Um, one topic. I will give you anywhere from probably four to seven or eight topics to choose from. Choose one. No research, no going to the library, no getting online, just you, your brain, and what you think about this topic in The Lord of the Rings. And you'll have a week to work on that. You'll turn it in the following week. Notice, then on the 30th, I cheated. That's not one novel, that's two. How many of you have read Harry Potter again? Almost all of you. How hard is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone? Or Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone? It's pretty fluffy. <laughs> this is like one and a half inch steak. I mean, it's chewy. It's really <laughs> chewy. This is like marshmallow. <laughs> yeah, it's what? Air blown. Put it in your mouth, it just melts. Not this. You don't chew on that, you'll die. <laughs> you'll get it. Okay? Tolkien is a master of description. 
which is what, if you've never read a novel like Lord of the Rings before, you're going to have a hard time. I'm, I'll tell you that right now. Because he'll spend an awful lot of time just describing, and you're like, get to the point already. Well, the descriptive aspect is part of the point, which is entirely what Peter Jackson missed. Tolkien says the meaning in a story is often found in the atmosphere in the story. That is, the ideas that are flowing around through the air, the songs and stories and legends and stuff that people are telling. And if you if you read The Lord of the Rings and you've seen the films, what does Peter Jackson do with The Lord of the Rings? What does it essentially become? An action movie. What kind of action movie? A lot of fighting, high fantasy. What's another phrase that we use for the kind of high fantasy film action movie? Swords and sorcery. How much swords and sorcery is there actually in The Lord of the Rings? There's three named swords. Aragorn has one. Gandalf has one. Bilbo. And then Frodo, because he gives sting to Frodo. Thorin had one, but Thorin's dead, because he got killed at the end of The Hobbit. Sorry to blow that for you. <laughs> <laughs> what about sorcery? Real sorcery. Like is there as much as it shows so far as Gandalf's fireworks? Gandalf's fireworks. Woo! Do Chinese make fireworks? Does that make them sorcerers? I mean, I mean actually. Pardon? It did at the time. Well, yeah, kind of. You know, gunpowder was woo. <laughs> but that's not sorcery. In the film, where do you see the sorcery? You see it when Gandalf saves Theoden from Saruman, right? For those of you who've seen the film, you know, he points his staff at Theoden and goes, come out from him, you know, and Saruman. Does the whole squirming like he's possessed, like this is a Catholic exorcism. <laughs> Tolkien was Catholic. I thoroughly believe Tolkien believed in the power of exorcism. That's not what happens in the story. Right? Aowen's involved in that too. Is anybody possessed in the Lord of the Rings? No. There's no quote unquote demon possession in the Lord of the Rings. Are there demons per se? Ring race get pretty close. They're pretty close to demons. Not really. Balrogs are probably the closest thing there is. Okay? But it's not sword and sorcery. There's, so there's got to be something else. Right? So, two days here. Why? Because the Philosopher's Stone and Chamber of Secrets can, can often, I've done it before, be covered in one night because... Those two stories are very closely wound together, okay? Um, and because we get to this monster, <laughs> Order of the Phoenix is 878 pages in the American edition. It's shorter in the British, not because there are fewer words, but they pack them closer together, <laughs> literally. The British editions are shorter, because there are more words on a page. Why? Because the American publisher thought Americans were stupid and couldn't read more words on a page. So there's more white space. I'm, I'm not kidding. There's more white space on a page. There are fewer letters on a page than there are in the British edition. Okay? Um, it's, and this thing's over 800 pages. This is, no, it's a little over 200. And that's about the same. Prisoner of Azkaban is a little bit longer. Goblin of Fire is substantially longer. It's well over 400. And then you get to the monster. And then, you know, Half-Blood Prince is pretty long. Deathly Hallows is pretty long. They're not close to this one. And we'll talk about why that one gets so much longer, et cetera, et cetera. And the time breakdown between the writing of them. All right? Then so we have Fall Break. And One Day for Prisoner of Azkaban, which is not a problem. <coughs> one Day for Goblet of Fires, we'll get behind. I can almost guarantee you, right? 
So two and a half days for Order of Phoenix, we have, I have to stick to it. I'm going to try and get it done in two days so that we can have two full days for Half-Blood Prince. Why? Because even though Order of Phoenix is so much longer, the Order of Phoenix could easily, easily be 250 pages shorter, and you wouldn't miss anything. I mean, there are 250 pages in that novel that do not lead to the next two novels. There are 250 pages of events and such that aren't central to the story. Half-Blood Prince, you can't take that out of anything. Everything in it is necessary for Death of the Apples. Right? And we'll talk about how these three, Philosopher's Source of Throne, Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, kind of work as a unit, and then Goblet of Fire, and then the last three work as a unit. That is, the first three are introducing us to Harry's world. The middle book serves kind of like a hinge from one to another part. It's a doorway. Okay? It's also the first time we see what happened. We see someone killed. In fact, the book opens <laughs> essentially with that. So the first two deaths are talked about in the past. Well, who's our audience? Kids. 10, 11 year olds, maybe nine year olds. I mean, the protagonist is an 11 year old. You don't want to talk about death with an 11 year old. And then it gets a little darker when Harry gets a year older. And it gets a little bit darker still when Harry gets another year older. And then he's 14. And you know what? 14-year-olds can deal with death. Not easily. They can. And, unfortunately, all too often, they must. <laughs> they must. And then, it, you know, once death is introduced, can you bar the door? Because you don't know what's going to happen next. Okay? So... We then finish. You've got some important dates there. Click on the link. Um, exams down at the bottom of that page. You'll write one, 750 to 1,000 word take them exam on Tolkien material. One on the rolling. Okay. You're going to have an, an instruction sheet that will come with that exam. That instruction sheet will have this Passage pasted into it. Okay? Notice very, very clearly what that says. And notice how important what that says is. It's in bold print, part of it is in all caps, and it's underlined. Okay? For the Tolkien exam, you must have five different quotations, not paraphrases or summaries, but direct quotations from the Lord of the Rings. Okay? okay. Yes. You just want like Small quotations, or do you want like block quotes? It'll depend upon the context. Okay. In fact, I just noticed I should revise that. It should say five substantive direct quotations. How does the word substantive change that meaning? Like it's still five different things in there? Yeah. Substantive means it has substance, it has weight. I literally had a student put for one of his quotations, quotation mark, yes, quotation mark, <laughs> page number. <laughs> Come on, man. How dumb do you think I am? You know? Did it work for the yes or the yes? No, no it didn't, actually. <laughs> because it came right after a previous quotation. <laughs> yeah, it, I've had to get so specific about so much over the last seven years. So, for the rolling, you must, and I, you know, I hate to do this because I feel like I'm treating you like elementary school students. Though I, I, I know, you know, my youngest son's now starting MTSU this year, and he would talk about stuff that his high school English teachers would have to do with their students. And I'm like, okay. You must have direct quotations, not paraphrases or summaries, but direct quotations, so that's pretty clear, right? 
from at least five different Harry Potter novels. Now, notice, I'd say five quotations from The Lord of the Rings, five different Harry, uh, direct quotations from five different Harry Potter novels. Every time I've taught this course for the last, I don't know, four or five years, I've had at least two people a semester who didn't do one or the other of those. That is, I had three direct quotations from The Lord of the Rings and five direct quotations from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. F. That's automatic F. Okay? Um, and it'll, that'll be spelled out on the exam sheet. You know, if you don't follow these directions, that will be an automatic F. And these are all great, how I'll grade the exam. I'll take your exam, I'll put them in order, and then I'll turn to your works cited page. And if I see one Harry Potter novel, F, and I set it aside, I don't even have to read it. I don't even bother reading it. Okay? Um, should I say this? <laughs> if you're that stupid, you shouldn't be here. Okay? Just if you're really, honestly. 90% of success in life is following simple directions. Literally. Right? Just do it. Um, even if they're stupid, just do it and get on with the rest of life. So, what else is this? Oh, that's stuff about what the rest of the paper, you know, formatting, all that kind of stuff. A papers, what kind of things I'm looking for. Paraphrases, which are important because you're not going to be paraphrasing, right? They will be dry quotations. Um, and in the top of your first paper, first page, should look like this. <laughs> anybody, anybody imagine what I'm going to say next? <laughs> Close. I used to have here my name, because if I were the author of a paper, I would have my name. Oh, I see. Yeah, and so I had you know my name over here. I actually received a paper in the last five years that had my name on it, <laughs> and I wrote on it. I didn't write this <laughs> F, and I didn't know whose it was, so I gave them all back, and one person kind of sheepishly said, and I was like, <laughs> I didn't embarrass him. I said. <clears throat> This one? Look at the date. And, you know. <laughs> so. Okay. Any questions? You have a grade, right? I have a what? You have a, like a midterm and grade also? Um, you can get up and, I, I won't stop. You can get up and go out and use the bathroom and get something to drink. Seriously. Again, it's going to be up on, um, up on YouTube, uh, and the reason I'm yeah. let's um, let's close this real quickly. Exit. Actually, so I had a real question. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so I'm kind of freaking out over here. Uh -huh. um, I don't really. I, I've never read fiction. I read mainly nonfiction. And now you tell me that I'm have to read a novel book or a novel week, and that'd be a little big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Lord of the Rings is yeah. And now these exams are going to be four pages long, and we only have 13 seconds. So what, what am I supposed to do to prepare myself for the book of the book? Is it something I can... I have no idea. I have no well, idea. I've never read any of one thing, that, one thing that would be really good if you had access to it, um, how long's your drive? I mean, are you off campus or on campus? All right, so I listen to audio books, but it's a four-hour audio book, so it might come across an hour. Okay. Like it's only eight sessions. Yeah, per, per week, or per book, per part. Well, you said you're four hours. You mean each book is four hours? The Fellowship of the Rings. Oh, okay. Like, oh. Yeah. Well, one thing you could do is listen to audiobook. I mean, not just when you commute, other times. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is that... Another thing that would help you get kind of into the stories without reading them. And I'm not saying this is the way to not read them, because you have to read them. In order to, to really 
to do well in this class, you, you've got to read the material, would be to um, go to my YouTube channel and watch one of the previous classes. They're all up. I mean, just church, what is it? I think it's just Dr. Ted Sherman. And there will be playlists, and there's a, you know, Tolkien rolling, and there will be a bunch of different ones from, from different classes over the last couple of years. And you can just start with those with the first one in the playlist, because that'll be from the first class on. And that at least will get you an idea of what's going to be covered each night. Because I, I mean, I record every one because I literally, I've been reading this book for 40 years. And every time I read it, there's something else. It's like an onion. You just keep peeling away layers. The only problem is you never get to the center. <laughs> okay. Um, so that would be another, that would be the, the other um, thing I would say. I mean, you just got to read it. You just got to buckle down. And, it's also 800 pages of allegedly reading. Oh. Start it now. Is there, is there like any assessments or quizzes or anything that you There will be quizzes. I think a quiz was mentioned on the syllabus. Probably a daily quiz. Um one over each of the books in the Lord of the Rings, one over each of the Harry Potter novels. They will range anywhere from 10 to, I don't know, 20 or 30 questions. Okay, They will be relatively major things. And, and they'll all be based on essentially what are called the journalist questions. What used to be called the journalist questions. Because I don't know what journalists do now, but they don't do what they used to. And those questions are who, what, when, where, why, sometimes why, and sometimes how. Who, what, when, where. Who's doing the action? Who's the subject? Who's Lord of the Rings is about who? Frodo. And who else? Samwise Gamgee. And then you've got a few other characters mixed in, right? Like close to a thousand. <laughs> okay? You don't need to know who really, probably for the quiz of the Return of the King, who Prince Imra Hill is. But Frodo, yeah, you better know pretty much <laughs> who Frodo. Gollum, definitely. Gandalf. Aragorn, Gandalf, Legolas. Who are we naming? We're naming the Fellowship of the Ring which we'll get to in a, in a little while. Elrond, yeah, he's pretty important. Uh, Sauron, yeah, he's pretty important. Okay. Shelob, Saruman, Denethor, Theoden, Boromir and his little brother, Faramir, Eowyn. Okay. These are all names that probably can show up, okay, depending upon which novel it is. Okay. What? What happens? What's the major plot? Fellowship of the Ring. Okay, that's the overall. Let's just talk about just Fellowship of the Ring. Show of hands again. How many of you have read these novels before? Put them way up so I can really see them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So not quite half of you. Okay? How many of you have seen the films? Okay, almost all of you. So whether you read the novels or saw the films, what's the plot of the Fellowship of the Ring? What is the purpose of that part? Of the overall novel. Establishing the fellowship. Establishing the fellowship. Louder. Transferring the ring. That's what Frodo thinks it is at the beginning, right? All I got, all I got to do is get to Rivendell. Get to where Elrond lives, and then I'm done. Figure out what to do with it. Figure out what to do with the blasted thing. <laughs> I will say damn every now and then. You know... Let's leave that one out, and let's try and leave that one out. <laughs> um, okay? So, overall plot. Frodo inherits a ring. Let's give the, see if I can do this, three-minute version. Frodo inherits a ring on his birthday. What birthday is it? Frodo's birthday. Thirty-third. Frodo turns 33 the same day Bilbo turns 111. All told, that's 144. So 
for their birthday party, they invite one gross, 144 people. And in the Hobbit world, the custom of Hobbits is to, on their birthdays, to give away presents, okay? Rather than receive. So they have this big old party, invite all these people to give all this stuff away. Why? To make it easier for Bilbo Baggins to give away the Ring of Power to Frodo, his nephew and now heir. Okay? So that happens. Skipping, you know, leaving a bit out. Bilbo goes off to the wild blue yonder. Frodo has the ring. Gandalf comes by, says, don't do anything with it. And he goes, okay, I want it. And then Gandalf goes away again, and he comes back 17 years later. And they start to talk about the ring. What does he tell ring? What does he tell ring about Frodo? Or Frodo about the ring? <laughs> What's he tell him about the ring? It's the ring of power. It is the one ring, the ring of power, as Tolkien puts it. I don't have the right page pulled up. The one ring to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. Okay? Over all these other rings that were made thousands of years ago. And Frodo has it. Frodo's like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Satan's ring. <laughs> what am I going to do with it? What's he going to do with it? He offers it to Gandalf. And Gandalf says, no. <laughs> He says, let's burn it. Yeah, that's it. Let's melt it. He's like, that's the right word. <laughs> Throws it in the fire. Gandalf takes it out with tongs, and he says, put your hand out, brother. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Drops it in his hand. It's not hot. I don't know if you've ever been on fire before. I have. Third degree burns, Blake. It's not fun. Hot metal, not good on bare skin. Frodo takes the ring. There's little writing in it. Gandalf reads it. And he tells Frodo, this is the one ring that Sauron made thousands of years ago that lost. He wants it back. Oh, and by the way, he now knows where you live. Great. Yay. Satan knows my address. There's more than one ring? There's one ring of power, and then there are multiple other rings. There were three rings made for the elven lords. There were nine rings made for men. There were seven rings made for dwarven lords. Okay. So you have the one rock, ring of power. <laughs> then you have nine rings for men, seven for dwarves, and three for elven lords, we'll call them. Okay. This one controls or can control all those others. And Frodo finds out during this little part, you know, they know where all those are. The ring lights have them. These, they think, um, Sauron has some. The others are all lost. These, these are hidden. Sauron doesn't have a clue really where they are, right? Because he doesn't have the one ring. If he had the one ring, he would know exactly who has them, etc. So, now Frodo has this. Describe Frodo. Short. <laughs> He's a hobbit. What else about short? Weak. Weak. Keep going. Fat. Short, weak, and fat. You don't really need to say much more than that, do you? He is not what? Warrior. He's not a warrior. He's not Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. Or smart. He's, say again? Uh, or smart. Yeah, or smart. In fact, Gandalf says... You must use such strength, wits, and heart as you have in this journey that, to destroy the ring. And that's when Frodo says, but I have so little of any of these, Gandalf. You are wise and strong and powerful. Will you not take the ring? Notice what he's doing there. Why? Because what is Gandalf? He's a wizard. What really is Gandalf? Does anybody know? I'm going to give it away. He is a Maya. What's a Maya? Like an angel. He is a supernatural being in human flesh. Guess what? Sauron is a Maya. Who 
The bulrog is a maya. Suraman is a maya. Okay. Elrond is not. <laughs> Elrond is a half elf. Half elf, half man. Okay. So you've got these supernatural beings down here. So you just offered a supernatural being who obviously has a lot of power and what? Four of Allah. History of the world, our world, what happens when someone who has a lot of power is often offered more power? Yeah. Gimme, 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 you know. There's the renunciation of power, right? Frodo offers him a ring? No. Gandalf says, with that power, I should have too much power. I don't care your politics. Can you imagine some Donald Trump saying, wait, no, nah, I don't want any more power. Can you imagine any president, frankly, or any Soviet leader saying, you know, I, I think the nukes we have are enough. I don't think we need to build more <laughs> nukes. No. It's always more and more and more. Look at Jeff Bezos. More and more and more, you know. Amazon's not enough for him. Now he wants to move into healthcare. Healthcare delivery by drone. <laughs> That's all power, folks. Okay? So, Frodo says, I want to destroy the ring. Gandalf says, wait a minute. Take a Sam. Why? Because he's been over listening to everything we've been saying. <laughs> so, Mick for Rivendell. Frodo's like, cool. Notice, not three minutes. <laughs> So they make for Rivendell. They have some problems. They run into a few people. They um, help along the way, etc. They finally get to Rivendell. Frodo's reunited with Bilbo because Bilbo's there. He's reunited with Gandalf because Gandalf disappeared. Right? And you get the Council of Elrond. The two most important chapters in all of the Lord of the Rings are the second chapter of the Fellowship of the Ring, right? the first half, in the second chapter of the second half, the Council of Elrond. Why? It's in those two chapters where Tolkien gives us all of the background we need to know of the entire story. Okay? So we have the Council of Elrond. Now, Council of Elrond is all for one purpose. What do we do with this damn ring? And they come up with various ideas. What are some of them? Give it to Gondor. Give it to Gondor. Who says that? Boromir. A warrior. Let a warrior have it. With this thing, I'll ride to glory. I'll keep your neck. Louder? What's all the age of man to rise? You wanted the age of man to rise? Yeah, you silly little elves, you'll put them in a book. Okay? What else? That's one option. They say, no, we can't do that. Okay? We'll talk about why in a moment. What else? In the film, they do. Yeah, that's where I was going. And they go, yeah, it's put it on an anvil, start beating with their hammers. And it's like, you know, Peter Jackson, you moron. <laughs> you, you can't do that. Okay? No. Here are some of the options. Send it over the sea to the west, to Valinor, where the gods dwell. Send it to Mount Olympus. Let Zeus take care of it. And Elrond and Gandalf go, we can't do that. Not their problem. They didn't make it. What do they do? Send it back. <laughs> They're going to go, not us. <laughs> we fought your problems before. Time out. Right? So that's an option. What's another one? Don't throw it over the sea. What's the problem in the, which one is it? Is it the second Transformers film or the third one? Or is it the eighth? I don't remember. <laughs> what do they do with what's his name after the first one? They drop him down in the trench in the Atlantic. And what happens? He's not all the way dead. He's only mostly dead. Miracle Max comes. And, for those of you who are Princess Bride fans. They revive him. Because what do they say with things that get thrown into the sea? They're not gone. Okay, they're not gone. Okay, can't do that. What else? There's this funny little guy named Tom Bobadil. Give it to him. He can make it disappear. <laughs> nope. Not his problem, Gandalf says. So, what's the solution? Destroy it. Yeah. Take it to Mordor. 
Take it to Satan's backyard. That's what you're saying. And throw it in his fireplace. Because that's what Mount Doom essentially is. And they're like, okay. Volunteers? Oh, I'm kind of busy. <laughs> and there's silence. Just like John Milton in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, says, puts in the mouth of the epic narrator, when God says, okay, man screwed things up. Who's going to make it right, essentially? Paraphrasing. And we're told there's silence in heaven until the sun says, all right, I'll do it. And Frodo stands up and says, I'll take it, though I do not know the way. And Elrond gives us this great, wonderful, philosophic thing about, you were meant to do this. Right? They leave. They head south. Now we cut a lot out. They go through all kinds of problems. They go through the mines of Moria. Gimli's all happy, you know. Troll, Troll happens. I don't don't say anything. Don't give anything away. They lose one of the members, and eventually they come to an island. <coughs> not quite an island. At a, at a river, and the guy decides what to do. Frodo decides, I'm going to go to Mordor. I'm going to go by myself. Why? Why is he going to go by himself? Temptation of the ring. No, it's not the temptation of the ring. It's, it a, it's an interesting interpretation that I think can be made. Close. It's his his burden to bear. And what does he want to happen to the others as a result of the temptation of the ring on the others? He doesn't want them hurt. So he tries to go off, and Sam realizes, and Sam jumps in the boat, and they go off together, and that's the end of the Fellowship of the Ring. Literally, I mean, the Fellowship, it's obliterated at that point. All right? Now, if you're readers of this when it was first published, you now have to wait like seven or eight months for the two towers to be published. You're sitting there, you're going, what happens next? And the book finally gets published, and you open the two towers, and you don't pick up where you left off. You're like, what? 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 Okay. And that's how Tolkien weaves the suspense in the remaining part. So, notice, you know, that's all the what. When? Well, partly. I mean, you got a span of years. From the beginning of the novel to the end of the, the Lord of the Rings, you've got a span of a little over 20 years. Why? Because from the party at the very beginning to when Gandalf comes back to tell Frodo about the ring, that's about 17 years. And then he goes off again. The, next, the remaining events, they all occur in about nine months. So the action is pretty quick. Where? Where does all this happen? Middle Earth. Middle Earth. Where in the world is Middle Earth? <laughs> middle, is, it the, is it the literal middle of Earth? And you're like, here's the North Pole, and they're in the equator. It comes from the old English word, midden yard. Midden yard. Yard. You all use this word. Midden yard. You just pronounce it slightly differently. You still have the y, and you still have the er, and you still have the d. Yard. Like mow the yard. Midden yard. It's the middle yard. Yard there is the word that means ground or earth. It's the middle earth. Go back to the beginning of Genesis. God separated the heavens from the earth. That's the above earth. This is the middle earth. And then there's a below earth. Okay? The middle earth, that's where we all live. So when is this? A long time ago. Why? Because this is our world. Arda, where middle earth is set, is our world a long time ago. Before even, quote-unquote, 
Jewish mythology. What do I mean by Jewish mythology? In the beginning. Before Adam and Eve. Okay? Are we kind of in Twilight Zone world? All right. Why? Round two. Round two. <laughs> this isn't the first time they danced with Sauron. He won the kind of one, previous ones. They won some, he won some. Why also? Okay, the ring is what? Or let me put it this way. Does the ring represent? Absolute power. Absolute power? Corruptness. Some have just said power. Corruptness. Corruptness. If you were reading this in the 1950s and 1960s, you know what most people would say the ring represented? Nazis. Nope. <laughs> Close. Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. The atomic bomb. Why? Well, who made the ring? Sauron. Okay. What does Boromir want to do with the ring? Use it. Let's take their technology and use it against them. <clears throat> How did we get on the moon? Me, not we personally, the United States. We used to we used to knock the scientists our rockets and We we brought over a guy named Werner von Braun. <laughs> who was responsible for the Nazi V-2 rockets. And he built our V Saturn V. <laughs> Still a V, right? <laughs> Rocket. Which launched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins in uh, the Apollo shot, right? Use that technology. So the ring we are told in that chapter on the Council of Elrond Can it be used for good? Why not? Because it was made for evil. Yeah, but what if my intentions are really good? What if I really want to turn it to good? Can't I? Yes? Okay. Partially. Go back to who made it. Sauron. Sauron. Is Sauron good or evil? He, he used to be good. See, that's key. He was made good. You have to read the Silmarillion. Published by Tolkien's son, 1977, several years after Tolkien died. To where we get all this information. Morgoth was before Sauron. Okay? Morgoth was one of those gods, kind of people that I spoke of. But Tolkien gives us his, his own whole creation story. And he tells us how evil enters the world. Okay? He, he essentially deals with what kind of um, rhetorically is just called the problem of pain. Why is there bad if a good god exists? Why is there evil in the world, etc.? Okay? So, Sauron is like the henchman to this guy named Morgoth. Morgoth gets destroyed by the powers, thrown into the abyss, the language they use, thrown into the abyss, and Sauron kind of says, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I was misled, it was an imperious curse, a little Harry Potter, and, <laughs> and they eventually accept his word. But then he shows his quote-unquote true colors, and he's bad, okay? And he makes this ring. But Tolkien tells us, when he makes the ring, what does he do? He pours the greater part of himself into it. Okay. Can something that is made, say by us, be, quote unquote, inherently evil? There's a clock. Handgun. Inherently evil. Inherently. No. The metal in it is, it doesn't ooze ev evility. It doesn't go, come use me. You know? <laughs> the ring does. The ring is inherent.
inherently evil. Its very being is evil. Okay? That's why it cannot be used. Because anyone who tries to use it will be used by it, will be overcome by it. Because we'll come to see the ring has a will of its own. That is, it has a level of sentience. Why? Because Sauron put that in it. Which is why they want to destroy the ring. Destroy the ring, what else do you destroy? Sauron. So evil is gone, right? Frodo thinks, according to what Gandalf says, if we destroy the ring, happy days. Everything will be bunnies and marshmallows and pretty color, colors and rainbows and happiness. No, Gandalf says. No. And evil will be gone. But evil will just take shape again in another form, in another time. We will simply be pulling the weeds out from our time. People coming after us, they've got to pull the weeds up in their own time. In the introduction, excuse me, the foreword to The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien talks a lot about the interpretation of the Lord of the Rings. And when he does so, he talks about two different ways of doing it. Allegory and applicability. Allegory. Tolkien doesn't like allegory, he tells us. Never did, even as a child. Why? What's an example of an allegory? You're all familiar. You all read some or heard some. So, an allegory is where you have something with a lot of symbolism and a symbol within the various symbols can only mean one thing. Okay? So, for example, oh, let's go back to the good old Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Whenever you saw a hammer and sickle, commies. It always implied commies. And whenever you saw old glory, the good guys. America. You know, <laughs> not drop the egg, just America. You know, good old Mur. Right? There's an example. What about this? Not the letter. Cross. Not even religion. What does this never refer to? The crescent of Islam. No, never. It never refers to the Star of David. You, you don't mix those symbols up. The oil and water, they just don't work. Okay? It never refers to Buddhism. It's always what? Christianity. Now, what kind of Christianity? Protestant? Doesn't matter. Christianity, or go to the base, Christ. It always refers to that. Now, in some stories, guess what it can be? It can also be what? T. It can also be a literal cross. That is, a means of torture. That's what it was for the Romans. Prior to Jesus, didn't have any religious significance. Other than the Old Testament saying that he who hangs upon a tree is damned. Kind of little resonance there. Right? So that always refers to that. Okay? That's allegorical. You're not free to reinterpret that as you want. All right? Applicability is very, very different. Applicability says you can read something. And look at what's happening in that story and look around at your life or look around at the world around you and go, hmm, there are some parallels here. Why are there parallels? Louder? The author put them there for a reason. 
For example, how many of you have read The Hunger Games? Anybody? Oh, good. A few of you have. Should I go there? Yes, the answer is always Any parallels? Any applicability between the world of The Hunger Games and the United States today? Did I watch what? No, I didn't. Have you watched any awards recently? Not recently, no, because I stopped doing that about 10 years ago. Because of. <laughs> the capital is like people on TV and stuff like People on TV, the media, where else? The capital! Is it capitalism? It's like a class struggle, almost. It is kind of, but it's not really a class struggle. It's definitely not capitalism. It's a, it's more of a oligarchy. I mean, I think part of what she's doing there, applicability-wise, I could be wrong here, is look at the capital and look at D.C. Big white building. Big white building. What else? Do the law? Do the laws that come emanate out of D.C.? Do they apply to those who are in D.C.? When I say D.C., Congress. No! No! Congress always has. Not every time, but there are an awful lot of laws that Congress writes, and guess what? Buried within those laws <laughs> are carve-outs that don't apply to members of Congress. Why did the Me Too movement not take down over 100 members of Congress who had been accused of sexual harassment, who made payouts because they weren't Republicans. Why? Because Congress has a slush fund. It was over $100 million. Where'd that $100 million come from? Me? And you? And me? And me? A true anarchist. <laughs> Say that a little louder so they can <laughs> be sure the IRS picks that up. <laughs> His phone already picked it up for him. I mean, that's that's applicability. Tolkien brings it up because he's writing this forward to the second edition in 1965. And he's already read all the stuff that people have said, oh, the ring is the bomb. No, the ring's not the bomb. The ring's kind of similar. But he says, you know, if you want to talk strict applicability, saying this equals this, or strict allegory, this equals this, well, what happened at the end of World War II? What happened to Germany? It was divided, right? Occupied powers. What happens to Mordor at the end of Lord of the Rings? No, it's not. Is it occupied? Do the Western powers march in, divide it up? Do they round up Sauron's henchmen? Do they imprint? I mean, he disappears. Tolkien says, no, it's, it's not the same. It's an imaginative story, but it has a basis in kind of his own personal history. Why? Because he fought in World War I. And guess what's kind of one of the things he implies? War is hell. War sucks, man. He tells us in this forward a very telling statement. He says, page XXIV, talking about war and such, the bottom paragraph. It says, an author cannot, of course, remain wholly unaffected by his experience, but the ways in which a story germ uses the soil of experience are extremely complex. Attempts to define the process are best guesses from evidence that is inadequate and ambiguous. We could literally talk about that sentence for probably the entire next class period. Because what's he talking about? One, how does an author come up with his ideas? Okay. How do his experiences affect the story? 
Because a lot of people want to do what with authors? We see it all the time. They're still doing it, even though it is an outmoded approach to literature. Psychologize. They want to look at a dead author and read the work and say, hmm, what does this tell us about his background? What does this tell us about how he thought about his personal hang-ups? I'm going to start teaching Shakespeare tomorrow. One of the things those students are going to have to do is they're going to have to do research for a paper. And I'm going to have a whole bunch of them who are going to come up with, oh, I want to do a paper about Shakespeare's quote-unquote sexual politics. Shakespeare's sexual, was he closet gay? Was he trans? Was he? And I'm going to gently say, no, 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 no. Why? He's been dead for over 400 years. The only way you're going to find anything like that out about him Find some way to bring him back and listen to him. Because his works don't tell us that. But Tolkien says, our experience does find a way. How do you, how do you know that? What do each one of you write from? Think of these. Your own eyes, which means your own perspective. Well, what's your perspective? Why? That is anathema in our modern society. To say, my perspective is my own and is different from everybody else's. Because I see one, two, three, I don't know, about a half a dozen white males in here. That means you're all what? Just white males. Or white females. Or person of color. That means you're all then what? Simply the group. Yes, no. Hell, no. Hell, no. Don't cast me in with some other bunch of people because of something they may have done because I scare a, a share a skin tone and sex. Because we didn't, we're the same. Yeah. Well, what's that word you just used in this direction? Which one? Anathema. Anathema? Um, forbidden. Damned. Okay? Not to be used, not to be said. Okay? So Tolkien goes on to talk about this idea of experience. Okay? Both white males, a little bit older. What's our shared experience? Living in the United States? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other than that, not much. Literally, not much. <sighs> Mine, which is why it's different from everybody else's in this room. I was born to two particular parents. They were each born to two. You keep going back. Five kids in my family. That is, I'm the youngest of five kids. My dad had a particular kind of job. My mom did. You know. And we could go through. We could break all those little particulars down. What does all those particulars mean? Every one of us, I'm going to borrow this for a second. Every one of us is carrying something like this. But this is nice and light. We're all carrying what? Our own personal baggage. For some of us, because of our life experiences, that baggage is what? Heavier than hell. It's like For other of us, others of us, because of our experiences, it's not that heavy. But that baggage does what? It's what directs our perspective. Okay? It's what tells us what we think is important in the world. And how does it do that? It filters out what we don't think is important. That essay on fairy stories, Tolkien says fairy stories do certain things for adults. Because he argues they're for us. They're not for children. Fairy stories, Tolkien argues, were never written for children. What do you mean? They have a little bit uh, a lighter perspective and they don't have any baggage. They live in Fantasy Island, man. They're walking around creating imaginary friends all over the place. They look at a rock. They think it's a diamond. It's a cool rock. And I'm like, put this. 
disgusting to put it down. Okay? They live with eyes of wonder. I can just tell from looking at some of you, you've already lost that sense of wonder, which is too bad in your early 20s. I'm 57. That sense of wonder has been so dead and buried for so long. Well, Tolkien says fairy stories can reawaken that. How? Because they can create in us, or they can clear for us our vision. He says they can give us recovery, which is regaining of clear sight. How does he define clear sight? Seeing things as they are meant to be seen. Okay, that just brings in, you just get... Dr. Bombardi and the whole philosophy department to come on over and talk about how are things meant to be seen? Because what does he mean by that? Let's talk about just people. How should we see people? Not people, plural. Individuals. How should we see each individual? First and foremost, as an individual. So if I go and I talk with somebody, and I'm talking with them, guess what happens to everybody else? Gone. What should the focus be? Right here. Nothing else. It shouldn't be what? What my purpose for the conversation in terms of how am I going to win this? It should be, as Tolkien puts it, is the purpose of these certain kinds of stories from the Middle Ages, shared enrichment. That is, when we both get something out of it. Okay? But he talks about that in the, in the context not of just random individuals. He talks about it in the context of our families. Why? Why are families? Why should I see my wife or have a conversation with my wife and block everything else out? Or one of my kids? Because Tolkien says what we tend to do and he, had a, he was married and had four children also. Guess what we tend to do with our families more than we do with anybody else? Louder? Put them in the background. Be ourselves. What do you mean by put them in the background? Why? Bingo. He refers to them as our familiars. We're used to them. Because we're used to them, what do we do? Possibly. <laughs> Take them for granted. Because you see that person day in, day out, a year, two years, five years, ten years, we'll be married 35 years next year, guess what that means? You assume what? Well, they're going to be there. And then what happens? 9-11. Or car wreck. Or some crazy student comes to campus and shoots the place up. And the people you thought were going to be there aren't there. And you can't do what at that point? You can't see them. You can't say anything. You can't express, you know. Too late. Tolkien says... What the recovery can do is it can allow us, it can enable us to see those people we see day in, day out as what? New. New. Like, go on YouTube. Do a search for, you know, person who sees for the first time. There's like a half dozen or so videos of these people who had the surgery. And there's this one, I'll probably... Here I'm talking about. There's this one of a husband and wife, and I think they were married about 10 or 11 years. And I think it was he was born blind. No, he had eyes, he just he couldn't see. And they did this surgery, and he saw his wife for the first time in 10 or 11 years. He didn't see her like I can see all of you crystal clear. He saw a shape. And that was it. Or people who have surgery who 
were born deaf, and they can suddenly hear, not Beethoven, Mozart, Chopin, just hear the buzzing of these lights. And they burst into tears. That's recovery. That's what Tolkien means. It's like being born anew, suddenly experiencing. So you have that, and what does that then do? It just kind of flows down and applies to everything. For example, you came in this classroom. What did you notice about this classroom? It's small. What else? There's no air. It's stiff, stifling. You got a lot of hot air blowing from here. The doors lock. Doors lock. Look around. Are the walls center block? No, they got this padding on them. And in between the padding, you've got these things. And then you turn around, you look at more, and you've got ceiling panels. And each of the ceiling panels has holes in them. But if you were tall enough and you could reach them, you, guess what? They not only have holes in them, they're textured. Just like this stuff. Actually, that's not because that's plastic covering it. This stuff is textured. That's all part of recovery. Tolkien says the whole purpose of that idea of recovery is to see everything as if it were brand new. Like, to use the biblical metaphor, you were at a put in the garden, and God just starts bringing everything in front of you. Oh, okay, name this. Rhino. <laughs> Elephant. Just whatever pops into his mind. He'd never seen one before. Did it have elephantness to it? <laughs> Does this have, I don't even know what you call this crap. Does this have whiteboardness to it? <laughs> it's white. <laughs> it looks kind of boardy. Uh, okay. So in that fairy story essay, he goes on about that. He also talks to me about, about these other things, which I'll talk about later. Okay. So that's the, all of this. The why. What's the why? Why, why do they need to do what they attempt to do at the beginning? To rid the world of what? An evil. Gandalf says, an evil for our time. Why? Because the people that come after us shouldn't have to deal with our problems. Climate. Personally, I don't think it's a problem, but we can talk about that later. What about what else? Here's one that's going to hit you guys a lot faster than the climate world: federal budget, a deficit. Because I mean, it's like a fire hose, but it's not water; it's just dollars. <laughs> just every one of you is contributing to, if you have a job, Social Security. Thank you, by the way, because I'll be using that in about 10 years. <laughs> you won't. And about 50% of me thinks it's not going to be there for me in 10 years. Why? Because it's a Ponzi scheme. Look up Ponzi scheme and then look at Social Security. It is a Ponzi scheme. It is, it, it's the exact definition. The evil of our time needs to be addressed by whom? You. Your children. No. Us. Us. What's been happening here? Pass the buck. Pass the buck. Pass the buck. Gandalf says, we got to stop passing the buck. We got to deal with the problem as it exists right now. Easy? No. Problems never are. Same thing, by the way. You, we can talk. We can do this almost the exact same talk about the Harry Potter novels. Why? Because stories are generally about conflict, good and evil. It the names just change. Okay. Um. What else should we talk about from that? Oh, one other thing in that paragraph. Talking about Tolkien's experience on page Roman numeral 24. You know, he's, he's talked about his personal experience, and one wonders, you know, how that experience finds its way. 
He says, um, one has indeed personally to come under the shadow of war to feel fully its oppression. What does that mean? To come personally, personally to come under the shadow of war to feel fully its oppression. All right, anybody in here a vet? No veterinarian, a military vet. Active duty? National Guard. National Guard, okay. Um, I've got a friend who served in the Battle of Fallujah which was hell's bells, you know. I've known other guys. I had a guy early when I taught here who was in the first Gulf War working with the Saudis behind the lines in Iraq and stuff. And, you know, he was special forces. And he had some great stories to tell. Great from the perspective of here. And we're going to hear people talk about what kind of stories make good stories in The Lord of the Rings? That is, somebody in The Lord of the Rings is going to say, ooh, this is the kind of story that makes a great story. So you get this, how do you approach literature kind of question. Well, here, any kind of story can be great, right? But when you got people shooting at you, that's, mm, that makes the story a bit different. When Tolkien says... One has to personally come under the shadow of war to fully feel fully its oppression. He he means you got to be in it, not even under the shadow. Like I grew up during Vietnam. Okay, I, I knew people who went to Vietnam didn't come back. But as years go by, it seems now often forgotten that to be caught in youth by 1914, Tolkien was born in 1892. So in 1914, he was 22. He went over as an officer, junior, like a lieutenant officer, in 1914. It was no less hideous an experience than to be involved in 1939. That is, guess what? To be 22 in 1914, that's no different than being 22 in 1939. World War I, World War II. Or 1969, when the draft was at its highest. But then he says, by 1918, all but one of my close friends were dead. Think about that. Think of your close friends, not your stupid social media friends, thousands of them. Your real close friends, the people you hang out with. Maybe it might be five or ten or fifteen. Kill all of them but one. Kill all of them but one. At the age of, by the end of the war, 1919, five years later, 27. What does that do about your outlook on life? What's it make you think about reality? Bleak. A little bleak, maybe. A little, you know, dark. It's all, it's not all, you know, happiness and good times. So, he goes on to talk about the, the chapter, The Scouring of the Shire. And he says, some people think that that came from what happened in England after the war. Because of some things that happened in He goes, not at all. Scouring of the Shire is one of the last chapters of the entire novel. Just before Frodo goes off to the Grey Havens. Right? To heaven, essentially. Tolkien says... That was in my mind from the outset of the novel. Why? Anybody know or remember what happens in the scouring of the Shire? Frodo and the other hobbits, they come back from the war. They come back from, I'll give it away, the ring being destroyed. I know. They win? <laughs> what? Frodo has PTSD, would be a modern diagnosis. But what do they have to do? Return to their normal lives. Return to their normal lives. Which at that point was going to the good old time. Okay. Back to their happy lives. Notice both, both people. Back to implies what? You can go home again. After war, you can't go. 
What? Not hungry. It's not hungry. That is, even if what is going on at the place hasn't changed. Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story in about 1921 or so called Soldier's Home about a soldier from a small town in Oklahoma who gone off to fight in World War I and then lived in Germany for a while afterwards and they came home. Eugene Krebs is his name. Why? Because Eugene Krebs has seen and done things you can't go back to that kind of life. So Frodo and them, they go back, and what do they what do they discover? Home isn't what it was. Why? Because they thought the battle was where? Over there. Major song from the First World War. Over there. Where have almost all of America's wars been fought? Except for, of course, you know, the Blood East. Over there, Europe, Japan. Okay. And then what happened? 9 11 brought the war where? Here. That's why, it was, I mean, other than the two towers in the Pentagon, that's what was so shocking. What did we think prior to 9 11? We got these two great big buffer zones called the Atlantic and the Pacific. North of us, Canadians. Nice. <laughs> Below us, South America, Mexico and South America. They're not going to let anything happen to us. So, Fortress America, until it wasn't. Right? So they come home and realize home's not what they thought it was, and they have to scour it. What does it mean to scour something? You clean it. And what does the cleaning involve? Death. Tolkien says he knew from the outset the Shire couldn't stay the same. Something, the events out there have what? Consequences. Consequences. Drop, the pond, drop the pebble in the pond, the ripples go on. Tolkien <clears throat> uses that image in The Lord of the Rings. We're going to see somebody, and I'll stop with this. Yeah, I'll stop with this. We're going to see somebody in the Fellowship of the Ring, go to a well. And in that well, he looks down. And I don't know about you guys, but I would have done the exact same thing. Well, how deep is it? <laughs> you see a hole in the ground, you want to know how deep is it. So you drop a rock. And he goes, and he picks up the stone, and drops it. While he doesn't hear anything, and then he finally hears where it hits water. And there's silence, except for Gandalf, who almost literally blows a gasket. I mean, he just, you know, is getting ready to, you know. <laughs> and then they start to hear. Hammers. Not a natural occurring sound. And he's like, oh, great. Okay. Why is that significant? Because that little dropping of the stone sets in motion. As Gandalf would put it, an avalanche. And if the stone had never been dropped, it's pretty important things probably wouldn't have happened. Important things that are necessary for the outcome of the story as we have it. Okay? What's Tolkien suggesting? Actions have consequences. We like to think, maybe I can do things and not have consequences. We, we, our society seems to say, I can do such and such. I can spend X, Y, Z amount of money and there not be any consequences. Like, you know, my, my debit card still has numbers on it. So it must mean I can go get money or I can use it as much as I want. Rather than the debit card is what? 
connected to a bank account. And if the bank account doesn't have money, I, I can't use it. <laughs> but we kind of tend to think the government is like the giant bank account, and it can just spend and spend and spend. Tolkien, you know, he's trying to, to teach, so to speak, a variety of ideas. He wants us to use applicability. Not allegory. And the reason for that is because in an allegory, the author gets to play God. And what, he, what Tolkien says that means is the author is telling you in an allegory, you can only read it this way. It can only mean this. It can't mean anything else. And he's kind of like, well, I would be exactly the same way. Don't tell me what I can't do. Don't tell me how to read something. I'll read it the way I want to read it. Okay. Tolkien didn't like authors trying to reach into his brain and say, this is what you must think. But we create such situations and scenarios that allows us to do what? Hmm. Maybe this means in my circumstance the case, etc., etc. Okay. Any questions? A little bit more than what I wanted to do tonight. Well, we've talked about fellowship, so we'll just do two towers starting in two. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, we'll stop there. Um, yeah, we'll start fellowship in two weeks. Well, I'll take that back. We'll do fellowship in two weeks. If you have questions, ask away. <laughs> <laughs>